So rolling in three, two. Welcome to the Tiny Bar Chats. I'm Edwin Escobar and my host. Michael Moon. And you know what? Let's go straight to our guest, Mr. John Gomes. How are you today? I am ex excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. My pleasure, my pleasure. So let's start from the beginning. Where does John Gomes' career path start? And I mean, maybe just not just career, but um, you know, your journey. Right. Um, as far as you want to go back. Well, I have to start when I came here, because that's when it started. When I say here, not only the United States, but Bridgeport. And that's, it was actually July 31st, 1981. Um, that's when I arrived here in Bridgeport. Because as Cape Verdeans, you flock to where the community goes, especially people that you know or family members from Cape Verde came here. Some uh, resided in Massachusetts, but the ones that were, out, were close to me were here in Bridgeport. So I came here, resided here in Bridgeport, right there in the hollow section of Bridgeport where I grew up. Um, came here, I was about nine years old. And, um, you know, with, at that time, you don't know, you're just looking for the American dreams. You don't, you don't know the culture, you don't know the language, but yeah, you're looking to make something better of yourself. So in order to help your family members and you only accept that as you get older and you see the opportunity that was handed to you. So that's really where it began uh, here in Bridgeport. And, um, and we kind of made trails in history through time. I see. And um, I was very fortunate because although I didn't grow up with my mother or father biologically, I had support of some family members because in Cape Verde, what happens is sometimes the struggle of life, um, certain parents are, you know, working almost 14, 15 hours a day. So you kind of grew up with other family members and there were the family members that lived next to us that really liked me. So I kind of, you know, babysitting one day, then became a week, then it became ah, every day. Yeah. And then here I am. So I stayed with him as, as my own family. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, I kept knit and relationship with my biological mother um, and my father as well. And, I see. Um, through the opportunity here when I came and then I became a citizen, I was able to bring my mother, I was able to bring my father and also bring my other 18 brothers and sisters. So we created uh, an opportunity for the family as a whole. Yeah, I can relate to that. I came here when I was 11, I, not by myself, but uh, with my mother and my grandmother. Right. Uh, and, you know, the American dream and do what you need to do. Right. Um, it, I can relate to that 100%. Um, so let's move uh, towards the future a little more. Um, when did you want to be of public service? When did that uh, became something you were passionate about and aimed to do? Well, I, I think I was always involved, whether it, it was the Cape Verde Association or the International Institute of Connecticut or s some type of avenue, I was, I was involved. And um, because I went to... Uh, my university, my degrees were in business. I went to work in corporate America and came back. I uh, became friends with someone that ran for um, state re representative way back. Um, and with that, I assisted him and helped him as far as campaigning. And just from there, got involved. Um, and because of my corporate and small business experience, I was given an opportunity uh, under two administration ago, and I believe that was the Finch administration, mm -hmm. to go in to work City Hall. Um, the idea was to direct a new department that was started at that time. And that department at that time was called City Stat or City Statistic. At that time, it was a hot trend that was going across America where many of the municipal government were looking to apply um, um, an efficient, transparent, and ac accountable government. Okay. And I was given the opportunity to go in and collect data, data, meaning go in and work hands-on with each individual department and understand their practices and look at how do we eliminate, you know, uh, waste. Yeah. And obviously that would be something that would benefit us, the taxpayers. Absolutely. Um, and um, I was fortunate to travel from New York City to Baltimore to uh, Massachusetts uh, and other cities to understand their, their best practices. And through a blank sheet of paper, we came back 
with an Excel spreadsheet, we begin to collect data. And with that, you begin to apply what needs to be done, what needs to be changed, and how it can be changed. But the unfortunate part is that we're in a system that's so political oriented, it's not result oriented, meaning mm -hmm. that you don't give, you don't have, it, it, it's 80% political and 20% oriented, result oriented. And myself, being a resident, a taxpayer, a father, small businessman, it's impacting my life. So I put the best decision forward as to what needs to be changed. Correct. But when you see the those that are in leadership position above you not taking or making those decisions that need to be made, it's your credibility at stake and you have to make a choice. And, you know, we had uh, some words and there was some decision and I uh, stepped away at that time. Um from that, um, from, you know, the municipal government, and then later on got involved. But I guess that's part of where I got involved, not knowing that, you know, I took it as a job, but that job had a bigger role. It was about changing the community. It was right. about changing the quality of life. It's about maximizing our tax dollar. Uh, it's about, it was about improving our quality of life. And the problem is many getting in the office with one vision, one word, but when you get in there, some forget. And I just wasn't one of those, so. Yeah, from the outside looking in, it seems like, yeah, you, you aim for a position and you don't know the full, uh, you know, the full spectrum of what it really takes and what, you know, what's involved until you're in it, right? right. I say that about the president. Once you take the oath and they walk you in the right room, whatever happens in the back room and they debrief you with all the yep. stuff that's really happening that we don't know. So I always take that into account all the way down to mayor, right? right? Um, so so that makes sense to, to what I really think happens, you know? Mm -hmm. But there's the difference between having integrity and saying, hey, I'm gonna fight against the grain or I'm gonna conform. And I think we see yeah. a lot of conform, conforming, right? Well, the thing is, if you don't live it, you don't feel it, you're not gonna execute it. Mm. I cannot tell you what crimes are going on if I'm not in that community. I right. cannot tell you the impact that's happening right. to that small business owner if I'm not walking in that small business owner and talking to them about what they're going through. I cannot talk to that teacher if my, stu my, my, my kids are not in that school. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, I have an accident and I have to wait three hours for police to come while others that are directing the city are taking our tax dollar and going to another town. They're not experiencing. Right. It, it becomes a nine to five. Mm -hmm. When you talk about public servant, it, it's something that you live in, it's something that you're breathing, it's something that you're doing it. Not not only for not not for the title of the or the paycheck, but you're doing it because it's a twenty four hour commitment that you have to your community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's in the title, public service. Yeah. Well, some forget, unfortunately. <laughs> many, yeah, many forget. If you don't, if you if you don't go through the same things that a certain community is going through, then how could you know what to fix? As you know, and yeah. that's, that's exactly the problem we're having mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. Um, and that's when you talk about the involvement over time, as you become more knowledgeable about what's going on, and you understand the resources we have. And it's not that we don't have resources. It's the misappropriation or right. allocation of the resources right. accordingly right. by also putting qualified individual in respective position to carry out the rule and responsibility that they should do according to the standards that we, the residents of Bridgeport, deserve. Yeah. Right. And, um, and until we as a community can fight hard mm -hmm. and demand change, yeah. status quo, remains and those that select to fight are outcast or push aside but it's all good yeah i just you know watching i mean the last messy set of four elections that we had and um uh, at the end of the day i do want citizens to take more accountability because if we more of us show up that stand by this then it's harder to continue to cheat that's just as simple as it is if we you know, you can't. I can't believe the amount of people that saw complaining on Facebook. Like I was like, okay, this, people are involved. I mean, shout out to Vizzy. Um, you know, he didn't pay a lot of attention to politics until he was involved in mm -hmm. your campaign. And I was like, just be ready to be disappointed in a lot of the stuff. You yeah. know, once you jump late in your life as an adult and try to care 
you're going to see a lot of the, like, oh, yeah. man, I can't believe this is happening. How come nothing's changing? And I always go back to our accountability right. as citizens, show up. And as an immigrant, I put a lot more effort into it because we don't necessarily get the same, I guess, um, results back home. Right. Um Voting, participating. So I, I, as soon as I got yeah. my my green card, I started my business, my citizenship. I'm, I vote for whatever right. it takes. <laughs> no, and the thing, is, the, the key thing, as you said that, is that we get involved, we see the failures, but the important thing is not to give up. It's not how you fall, but how you get up. Exactly. And that's the message that we got to keep telling the people. We are a population of about 164,000 so people, and yet less than 10,000 decides an election, which is single digit. It's and, not representative. And then when you look at certain demographic where one district out of the 10 district could make an impact, percentage are very small. And, and you just have a, a recycled thing of politician without any policy, without any objective. And there's no accountability because it's a, it's a selective few that are, that are showing up voting because they have their own self-interest, meaning mm -hmm. a job or a job for their family or certain things that they are one of interest. So it, it's an unfortunate situation, but we got to continue to to keep fighting, keep going at it. I mean, I ran back in 2011. I ran again this time, and I'll keep doing what I have to do as, as, as bringing information to the people and also anything that we see that, that needs to be changed. Yeah. And, you know, that how can we change if we don't participate? Mm -hmm. And then- We have to just remember right. that. Um, and look, the narrative of voting doesn't mean anything has been loud and is, it's been very popular amongst, especially our people. Oh, voting don't matter, man. Like, don't don't let that. If it didn't matter, they would let your dog vote. <laughs> like, well, trust me. Well, if you see efforts to kind of narrow who can and right. who can't vote, it matters. Okay. No, it does matter. And, and I think right now, you know, we're at a point, especially after this mayoral election, where we gave reason as to perhaps why your vote doesn't count. Because we saw the voter suppression. We mm -hmm. saw the civil rights violation. Correct. We saw that uh, ballot stuffing, the ballot box stuffing. Mm -hmm. So now more than ever, we got to keep going and say, see, I told you. So now we got to change. We got to bring new people, new new ideas. And we're, we're having a lot of people move into Bridgeport um, because of the economics. And hopefully those people get more involved and get Please. more more um, more of our kids involved to change the narrative. Because you have a city which since... Um, I believe 16, uh, 1836, which was founded mm -hmm. for a population that's almost 80% minority or majority between the blacks and Hispanic. We have yet to have a minority mayor. Mm. And you're talking about a city of almost a billion dollars as far as a budget when you take into account grants and other things that come into the city with 22,000 students. Um, and, you know, if you put 1.5 parents per, per uh, student, you can imagine the magnitude we would have if the turnout and participation yeah. was higher. We are the most populated city in one of the richest states in this country. Oh, yeah. We have 19, 19 miles of uh, water, waterways. We have um, 95, you know, Interstate 95 right over the highway to connection to New York. Um, we have some of the most beautiful parks in the state. Um, I mean, you name it, we have it. It's... Is leadership, it's accountability, yeah. it's inclus inclusivity. We right. don't have inclusivity, and that's what we need to bring into Bridgeport, where everyone feels proud and participate, and many are tired. They're like, the hell with it. And we got to keep saying, no, you got to keep going, you got to keep we going. We got to keep them in their spirits. And that, that, that becomes a tough job. Um, and I always tell people, you know, if you ask me who I'm voting for and all that, I always give people, I, mean, I don't hide it, right? But get, go to the polls. I can't tell you who to vote for. Right. If you ask me my opinion and why you need reasons A, B, C, and D, or if you need some education and you know why are you against this or why whatever, like I I, I will say, it, but mainly participate. Yeah, because no, that's there's no thing. sort of losing. Like if you have a fair election, mm -hmm. and and you the you know it's a if it's a fair election, then you take take the laws, whatever. Right. But when there's so much so many gray areas right. and so much stuff that it's almost too obvious, but people are just like, uh, well, we don't know. Uh, so then it's like, eh, it doesn't feel very fair. But, but cha change is coming. In change is coming. I believe in it. It's coming. I it's coming. It. I think you brought a fresh, a very fresh uh, uh, approach and you kind of, 
it could close, and mm-hmm. I think it worried. Well, what you can <laughs> understand here is that, you know, we, those that were involved in my campaign, went against a 50-year-old gen- generation that has been in, mm-hmm. uh, institution. Uh, we fought against many who were forced to contribute. Uh, many that donated one dollar to me, they put in sweat equity, meaning they were part of my campaign because they believe in the cause. Yeah. And we were a campaign that was about policy idea. It was about job creation. It was about better education. We really put issues and policy up front to talk about. Yeah. Because many of the elections that you see, it's almost like a pageantry. Okay. There was no substance. Yeah. Um, they really don't dig to understand who's the candidate, or qualification, what they're going to do better for the community. It's more nominated by a corrupt system, a democratic system that we have exposed in the city. And a selected few show up to vote and they win. But that has changed. And I believe more changes are coming because as of today or as of the, the last election that happened, there was almost I would say probably between 26 to 30 complaints at the SEC about mm-hmm. corruption, bribery, forgery, you name it. Uh, and there's course to be taken on those along with the 2019. So th- I, I think, um, you know, things are happening quicker. And hopefully as a result of that, we'll bring justice and transparency and, and really secure that sense of um, a credibility and trust back in the system. Because right now the voters are Bridgeport. Are, are disenfranchised or the majority don't mm-hmm. feel they're part of the outcome and that's what we need to change and hopefully yeah. I, I agree happen. 100% um, you, uh, you you made a very important point about not losing hope and people do have like a lot of reservations um, but and this is what we have in yeah. this interview because uh, you know besides you know sound bites and little yeah. moments uh you you men of the people, right? We're living the problem. The, yeah. the, the problems that we're talking about are real and the yeah. resources are there to fix it. Now we need to take that step and change those that are in leadership position. It's not only the mayor. You have state reps, you have state senator, you That's have state, 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 state senators, you have city council members, you have boards of uh, commissionership with, throughout the city. We just need involvement. And, and once we begin to be proactive and more involved, we will force changes to happen. Yeah. I mean, we see what's happening with the education system in our city. It's underfunded. It's underrepresented. We have people who really are not given the resources necessary where they need to be. Really good people. You you have a, a mayor, for example, that has never attended a board of education meeting. And I mean, there's tons of things that could be done. And and, yeah. and, and the ideas have been put out there through my campaign and um, my candidacy and other people that ran with me on the slate. So um, we're not giving up. Uh, we'll we'll keep uh, focus, and um, you know we'll uh, hopefully you know justice will prevail. Yes, I know that sounds, but that's what you no, have. No, you have to start somewhere. Because someone's yeah. got to do it, right? And it might not hit the first time around, but it will shake things up enough that you keep going. Right. That's how life is, right? So no, we, we're gonna come back to this in a little bit. Let's go this way now. Um, you speak five languages, correct? Well, I try, you know, I, <laughs> the, the humble four, four guy. or five, four or five. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's easy because, um, you know, I'm Cape Verdean. Cape Verdean is West Coast of Africa. We were, we were colonized by right. Portugal in 1975. So our main language is Portugal, but we speak di- uh, the dialect, which is Creole at home. Um, you know, here, uh, Spanish, you know, you study in school and so French. So it, you know, it becomes... You make it sound so easy. No, it, 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 the <laughs> I, European, can't speak, I can laugh in French. Yeah, European languages are somewhat very similar. Um, but, uh, and then you have friends of different culture, different languages, so you adapt quickly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like I said, I, I like to be a mayor of all people. <laughs> I mean, the relevant languages and... Uh, so my experience, I only speak two, right? English and Spanish. I was raised speaking Spanish. And one thing that I realized just thinking back, which I didn't know it was odd, but it is odd. I did it, I, I think I stopped thinking in Spanish maybe 10 years ago. I've been here 26, 27 years. Okay. Um, I still have an accent, duh. I don't know why, but. I, I get the same thing. It just is what it time, is. I was like, wow. <laughs> so um, I'm not proud of my accent. Uh, but it was funny because I I was 
I would process my thoughts in Spanish and right. then I would say it. So it was like, and now I don't, now I think in English. So um, it does expand your view of the world when you right. can speak different languages. I think language is like a vessel for thoughts and right. ideas and concepts. And there's, it doesn't matter how much right. you can translate certain concepts. An idea in a certain language, it just means something completely right. different. No, and, and what it does, it, it brings a sense of, of openness yeah. to when you meet people and you be able to speak their language. It, it sense opens it up and it also allows you to communicate better. Yeah. And culturally, you're able to um, tie in to their personal experience. So yeah. that, that definitely helps. Do they even yeah. offer language in schools? In I haven't been in, in the school states in a long time. Do no, they, they do. The uh, I mean, so? now they are even offering, I, I think, uh, Arabic, Chinese. Really? Wow. Uh, so it, it's expanding. I don't know what are the curriculum, the, re, the prerequisites, but I, I know they are offering. I mean, French, Spanish always, but I, I know yeah. they expanded into other languages as well. I hope you something to learn Chinese or Japanese. Huh? Well, I could say that's something I always wanted to learn. That's something I always wanted to learn. Well, we could always start by saying Ni Ho. Ni Hao. Ni Hao. Ni Hao. Ni Hao Ni Ho is something different. Ni Hao Ma. Ni Hao. Ni Hao. Let's talk about a little bit about business because I think that's one of the things you brought to the table um, to be able to administer. A, a city yeah. is um, pretty much a it can function like a business, right? Yeah, I mean, my, my background going into City Hall, I was I was in the chief administrator office position, which allowed me to administer. We have 19 divisions and 41 subdivision. I believe now the budget is up to $610 million or so. So that gave me the ability to understand with the background coming from City Stat and, you know, understanding the, the, the details of what needed to get done now being administratively in charge it made me understand the resources that were needed. But more importantly, it gave me an opportunity to bring the directors in. For that one year, I was left to do a budget because when I came came in in, tw in 2015, only one budget was, you know, before some political things happened, mm -hmm. I was allowed to do one budget. And during that session, I brought in the directors to actually be part of the budget process to really, from a departmental standpoint, tell me the needs, the wants, but also understanding um, the goals and the resources that were available and how together we could could put one year budget, but look at the three year period and how do we get there. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, worked in corporate America. So that kind of, you know, that helped me a lot. Understanding the function, the roles. Right. Of managerial ability and, you know, the process. So, so let's go back into that. So, in in your business experience, right before uh, any part of an, any administration, um, what is a remarkable moment that you remember from that um, from that time when you were you traveled internationally, right? Yeah, after I, that, can you give us a little bit about that experience? Um, I worked with Nestle for about twelve years. I manage. Um, I worked local, and then after I obtained my master's in international business. I took the assignment with the foreign trade division and I was headquartered out of Trinidad and Tobago. Shout out to Trinidad and Tobago. You know, and mm -hmm. then I was in charge of Bahamas, Bermuda, Aruba, Borneo, Curaçao. So I was, and lived in Miami. So we were traveling to those different countries and my responsibility is that I had um, vendors. I was responsible for vendors in the individual countries and all aspects of marketing sales for any Nestle product worldwide. Um, and, and that was great because, you know, not only are you visiting different countries, different culture, but you're also um, living with the people. Meaning, I, you know, when you picked me up at the hotel, I went there and go back to the hotel until the end of the day. And we really explored the city, the town yeah. and understand the culture, uh, understood what the people wanted as far as the product on, on display or the sale price or what's needed that wasn't in the country. So that gave you uh, institutional knowledge to be built on the various culture across, especially within um, those countries. And for me, it was ironic because the first time I arrived in Aruba, in Aruba, they speak Papimento. And they papimento? Say, papimento. And they say, Como está bem? Como está bem? Como está bem? Like, how, Como how you bem? doing? How are you? Como and then bem? in Creole, from where I'm from, say, Como está bem? So it's almost like, ah, so I found out thing. that a lot of... yeah. Um, the languages were very similar yeah. and they spoke with me. And then the first time I was like, wow. And that was uh, something that kind of really, um, I'll always remember it. 
Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're in Aruba, Curaçao, and Bonaire. And I love going there because I almost could understand the people without knowing their language. That's awesome. And yeah. then they spoke Dutch. You think Dutch. it kind of migrated there? Or? Yeah, it came there uh, for, uh, I think, with the Portuguese. Yeah. Back for um, well fishing, yeah. from what I understood. Yeah. Uh, and then they just... Um, they they stay there even yeah. though after the, that industry kind of died they stay there so um, that was one of the cool things. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that, that those little <laughs> moments that stick with you, right? No, it, it it's cool. And then the products. I mean, the products that they had there versus anywhere else in the U.S. is different. And then to deal with. Yeah, my, Milo Supplegen and all these other products in the Caribbean. Milo, shout yeah. out to Milo. Yeah, no. <laughs> I grew then, up on Milo. You know, and then here it's it's about quick and other U.S. products, so it's a little bit different. Yeah, so, cool. yeah. I've learned that the you know there's a different makeup and there's all these different things. Um, right, and and then let me tell you, I mean, waking up in a hotel by the beach was pretty good. We have a special guest in the back named Gina. <laughs> <How's it going? laughs> um. So, I hope uh, she's, she's liking me. She likes me. Yeah, what's, yeah, what's yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's <laughs> probably because she wants. To, you um, need to go outside, Gina. So, yeah, she'll be fine. Yeah, she'll be all right. Uh, she's my producer. She's really one running the show. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as he's going out, meeting the people, ingraining yourself to understand instead of like looking at things from up above. Right. But I, I would I would say one thing. Um, uh, you know, the suit, the 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 truth will set you free but traveling will set you even more free. Uh, it, it just exposes you to the world. Yeah. I think right. it, it can free you from any misconceptions or prejudices that you may have. Um, and it just helps you feel small and big at the same time, if you know what I'm saying. I, I, if, if, you, if I had all the money in the world, I would travel and document it in different ways, whether it's yeah. a podcast or a film, or if I find a dope artist, music video, um, uh, and sometimes a private conversation with someone that you don't have to air it, you don't right. have to film it. But try, I, I think traveling is the answer to a lot of like uh, right. a lot of depression. A lot yeah, of no, it broadens your horizon, your experience, and then somewhere somehow you're able to put that experience back into your everyday life or community because you're able to see things differently. Simple thing as the type of food or the, what they eat or how they sleep or what's their daily routine. And I mean, you come back to Bridgeport and meet someone from a country you've been at, and it's like, oh, you know, that yeah. kind of automatically opens that conversation per yeah. se. Definitely a nice icebreaker. Yeah. Speaking of food, um, what's your go-to? This is random, but what is your go-to? Like, where you something you can eat and won't get tired of? Well, I have to say cachupa, which is the Cape Verdean dish typically from Cape Verde. It's cachupa. It's either you have it made re the way it's supposed to be with corn, where whether you have collard greens, pig pea, or whatever you mm -hmm. want in it, or you have it refried with some eggs in the morning, some mm -hmm. linguiça. So, you know, I, I would say actually here, we did, I don't have many businesses that, ha that sell it. And actually about two weeks ago, we drove an hour to Rhode Island. We went to grab some and ate you can't, it. You, you can't find it. Well, it. well, you could find it if somebody at the house make it, but there was like oh, yeah. no, no business no, that business made. Yeah, made. that made it. So what, just, what, what, what is it exactly now? You Cachupa. Said, it's it's uh, it's corn, but different islands because we have ten islands in Cape Verde make it different. Some make right. it with collard greens and and, and pork. Yeah. Some make it with tuna. Yeah. Some make it with vegetable. Mm. Um, it depends where you are on the island, but the the main. Part of it is the corn. Uh, yeah. You got to have certain type of corn. It has to be certain size. Yeah. It's so, a, the, the white corn that looks like teeth, like the Peruvian corn. <laughs> like yeah, baby, almost like, like teeth, I mean, so. they sell it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's that. Yeah, you gotta, I forgot the right name. I, I, I made real I, I, weird I, I, comparisons. You need to... Uh, I think I want to try it. Actually, I'd like to try it. We're gonna, we're gonna. This is gonna be. You know, this podcast is gonna be something that we're gonna well, listen, do. Well, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll have, I'll have some family members cook some, and then we'll, we'll on my next episode, we'll, we'll try it. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I take. We it comes to food. As long as I'm I will hunt you back. down yeah. for food, man. Because I mean, corn and uh, corn and collard greens, like you know, some of my favorite vegetables. Yeah. So. Well, in Cape Verde, yeah. like, as I explained, because of the weather, because of the lack of resource, corn, it's it's a main function. I mean, I'll tell you, we make from couscous to everything else with corn because yeah. that's what but you know, it'd be we could afford. Oh, no, no, yeah. it's without a <laughs> doubt. So, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite things. I mean, yeah. none, you know. What, then, what is one of your favorite foods that you go to? My favorite food uh, would like be... Like something you can eat without getting tired of. Without getting tired of it. Um, 
I would say Dumbo, like Dumbo from like uh, New oh, Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. Like New Orleans. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It's delicious. It's delicious. Yeah. I'm, I mean, mine's it's mine's really obvious. It's it's rice it's and beans. But they have paisa, the Colombian yeah, dish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with collard greens. So sometimes yeah. it's just beans. With greens yeah. that my mom makes is like, I don't get tired of that. Makes yeah. a difference. There's certain foods that I do avoid because I never want to get tired of them. I have a real relationship with food. But mm-hmm. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, what, what do you do when you're not out here trying to make changes and, and taking care of business, running businesses, family. Well, what do you do for fun? Or what do you do I, to unwind? To unwind, I like the gym. Uh, and then, you know, you could put me with a little, you know, a little cup of, you know, cognac and a cigar and maybe some um, romanza in the back with some music. <laughs> I'm good to go. Oh, like a, but, yeah, okay. I, that, that's what unwinds me. Sometimes when it's too much, too, too much going on, I kind of escape. You'll see me somewhere in my usual spot with a cigar and a Hennessy and just mellowing out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, you know, like everybody here in the in our in our city, we we go through the ups and downs and the emotional emotional here and there. And but we're all um, fighting the, the everyday the everyday struggle, you know, yeah. whether it's family, personal, financial, and other things. We're just trying to make ourselves better, and you know. Uh, it's been rough the last probably two years and some because unlike other candidates, I gave everything to the campaign uh, and that, you know, now you're trying to unwind and put your life back on that personal mode. So it, it, it's getting there. A lot of people don't understand the putting yourself out there like that. Um, it, it, it takes a toll. I mean, uh, family supports you. Right. There's a lot of people on your side. But it's not all easy. Like it demands a lot from you. Yeah. No. It, it, if if you're running a campaign the way it needs to be run, not on part time basis, mm-hmm. with real agenda policy and real people that are focused and we're doing the job that needs to be done, it, it, it takes a lot. But you know, the rewarding part is that when you see others contribute along with you and putting themselves at at risk. Um, some in my campaign trail lost their jobs because mm. they put everything on the line for me. Uh, you had some that took their personal time away from family, friends, um, children growing up mm. uh, to, you know, dedicate to the campaign. So we did it knowing the the work that need needed to be put into it, but we also um, knew what can come out of it. And, you know, although we wanted in our time, but it's all up to God's time and grace where mm. where it's going to end up. But I think the sweat that we put in and the work dedication is kind of showing itself. And many things that our campaign has said needed to get done that pe- some people ignore are now seeing that you were right or we were right. Right. So, but, you know, hopefully, again, change will come and we don't give up. We just keep going. Yeah, I think that's a good that that's a good note. Um, it, it's gonna take more than one round. Yeah, it's gonna take more than one, yeah. and it's gonna take support and having a little more faith and commitment. And, commitment. So commitment. Yeah. Commitment. commitment. It, it's it's about commitment. You know, it's easy for you to run a campaign from inside City Hall, where you have the people on the dime of our taxpayer, where you have a paycheck, where you have everything set up for you. But it takes twice as hard when you're underdog, you're on the outside, you're going against an incumbent that historically has been there, a system that has been entrenched within mm-hmm. the culture or political culture of Bridgeport for decades. That's where you see the work that goes into it. And then for you to come and win on the polls twice, but only to lose to the absentee ballot because of what you saw happen later. The repetitive it, 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 it kind of says, you know what? You know, we're good. We're going to keep going. Hmm. I have a odd question. If not you, is there anybody that you would get behind if they ran? If for some reason you wouldn't, is there anybody you would champion to take that, to take take the baton and right. move to, to what no, you I, started? I, w- one thing I always believe in is about um, uplifting our youth and others to keep going up. And that's part of the mistake politically that we have in the city. Um, we have people that hold position for too long and do not 
train or give knowledge or pass the knowledge to others to uplift themselves for the next generation to come. For me, I, I, I you know, it's about what's best for Bridgeport. It's about those that carry the right ideas, the right philosophy, the right policy, mm -hmm. those that actually live in the consequences of what they're talking about they're going to do. So I would be definitely willing to do what needs to be done as long as Bridgeport is put first and foremost with a clear agenda about the goal set and the benefits that it would bring to Bridgeport. Uh, so we're going to be right back. Okay. Uh, we're going to go on a little break, um, and then we're going to jump back into some of the election stuff, and I'll have more random questions for you. Bring we'll it. be right back. Today's episode is sponsored by Soul Food Sundays, the home for the creatives. This episode is also sponsored by Mobile Registration Services of Connecticut. That's 40 Fairfield Avenue, Bridgeport, Connecticut. This episode is also made possible by Exhibit B Agency. Designing bold futures for bold brands. And we're back. How you feel? Me, I'm good. How do you feel? I'm, yeah, you know, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so as promised, nah, um, it, it, this podcast is not a, a, it doesn't have a political agenda or uh, a controversial aim. But I did see some, uh, what I really call ugly stuff during the campaign, right? right. Uh, which I've seen use and repeat it usually by the right to I guess dissuade people from you know pretty much get them to leave them you know from being Democrats to going to Republicans but uh you know the the city is made up of black and brown people mm -hmm. and I saw a little bit of division being used throwing your name in the dirt like right. Um, and I did want to give you uh, an opportunity, not an opportunity because you don't have to explain yourself, but uh, just address that. Like why? Because it's an ugly thing. And I, as far as I know you, you don't not you don't give those vibes. Yeah. Um, there were, you know, I think some of the stuff. You correct me if I'm wrong. Was like John is not for black people, and um, and I hate when I start hearing that narrative because it doesn't come from the community is usually no. inserted. No, I mean, that that was uh, an agenda that was put forth by a selected uh, few people uh, where we're trying to carry that message. Um, and that was done simply because some that were carrying that message knew they were, they've been milking the system for too long. They've been taking advantage of what is rightfully should be shared equally across. So they don't want anyone in elected office in the mayor's position that has his own mind, ability, speak the language, could relate to the people in the city of Bridgeport and can make the decisions based on skills, knowledge, and is not afraid to say, you know what, this is wrong, this needs to be fixed. They brought that in to say I'm not black enough. Well, listen, I'm from Africa, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even gonna it's just- a ridiculous notion. I'm not even gonna go there. And then they were like, well, he doesn't like women. Well, I was raised by three women from Africa, so <laughs> whatever. Let's stick to the issues and yeah. the facts. And the fact was that, you know, our campaign had measurable goals, had timetable, and you had someone that would take a leadership position with key knowledge about government operation, those that are there, those that are not doing their jobs, those that are milking the system, mm -hmm. and those that need to be changed. And probably those that were speaking the loudest were those that shouldn't be where they're at. They don't have the qualification. They don't have the ability. They've been um, abusing or, are be, or were part of that voter suppression and civil rights violation. Right. Uh, and, you know, um, because my resume speaks for itself. Um, and, and that's really all... And no matter how they came at me, I stuck to the substance, to the reason why I'm running, Correct. The, the purpose why. So I really didn't lose myself in addressing these, you know, they want to speak loud, speak loud. I keep focused on the message and what we're about. Because I think the tactic is to, uh, you know, distract. Right. And, and, you know, I hate, I call it headlines and, you know, headline journalism, which is like no substance, but like a nice headline. Yeah, and they tried to put a little... Uh, it was a uh, demonstration with three people. Uh, you know, they, they circulate things around their community, go on social media. I mean, direct threat to myself and my residents, where I'm at, what I'm doing. 
but you know that was part of it um yeah i just you know there were things that they didn't need to be addressed i left them as they were and there were things that i needed to address i addressed them but the people that were in my support in my corner knew who i am and who you know what i'm about yeah and the changes the right changes that i could bring to bridgeport and that's the most important thing yeah and that was shown when you win two election by popular votes yeah and you don't you don't you don't you don't win by having 40 percent of your votes as absentee ballot yeah that's uh, so that tells you yeah it's, it's it's a pattern yeah it's a pattern and i only ask uh, uh because i think that's one of the ugliest strategies uh that to divide people and it's usually your people yeah. right um and do you I, imagine, I, I hate those things do you man. imagine that what we could do is if we come together as a community i mean that's why be, so because division. those that are creating this animosity are not part of our system. They're not from Bridgeport. And they're using others within our community to s divide us. And that's what they want while they go to their house in Monroe, in Hamden, mm -hmm. in other outskirts of, uh, outside of Bridgeport. They take our tax dollar and they use our tax dollar. They change a, a system to benefit their businesses, their their zoning regulations to benefit their, 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 their businesses. While we suffer the consequence and yet we fight among each other. And it's like, really? Yeah, I, I, it should be a healthy level of competition on who can do the best job, but it should never be derogatory. It should never be based on lies and based on just who can say the meanest thing. <laughs> that's that's a ridiculous thing. But yeah. politics. Politics. And, I mean, you, you have thick skin. And uh, again, I ask that because personally, I know politics can get a little dirty, you know, a lot of junk talk right. and then ads. But, but once you try to... Like you said, it's a ridiculous notion. Like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm closer to what you've been used to for decades, but mm -hmm. yet you are accusing yeah. me of these horrible things. And, and listen, we have it, it's it's a minority community saying that the minority man is not qualified because he's not black enough. But yeah, you're supporting <laughs> a white man. Yeah. Let's be real about it. <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, it's, that's kind of like what's happening. Yeah, the I'm, like, I'm like, come on. So, uh, it, Mike, I never really asked you how involved are you in voting? What's your experience as a voter? Because you you were born in America, right? Yeah. So, um, what, what what's your experience been like in, in different stages of your life? Voting, um, Being, like feeling like your vote matters and just participating um, in politics. Well, for me, I I know my vote matters. Um, I still vote. Good. I haven't voted in a local election in a while uh, in New York. Um, but yeah, I vote. I know my vote counts. It, it, sometimes you get a little, a little discouraged because you vote and the wrong person still ends up being uh, elected. But uh, I vote. No, one of the most important elections that you, you really you could get in, involved in is your local election. From the bottom up, because yeah. that, that, well, my that, mom was always involved. Yeah. she was she was part of um, Jimmy Carter's campaign when he won the presidency. She took me to the couple presidential inaugural and a couple and, years ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> said a couple years ago. <laughs> that was a while ago. I was, yeah, that good, really good point because yeah, the, <clears throat> yeah we, we vote. Yeah. Like just participate, um, you know. Yeah. And one big difference between local and say presidential or presidential is this electoral college and yeah, yeah there's that extra layer. We have popular vote in real life. Okay. Except now we have I the think the electoral college is ridiculous. I think that's a what? farce. Electro electoral college. I think that's mm -hmm. a farce. It's it, so there's a lot of controversy around that. How do you feel about the electoral college? Well, it's the people making the are the ones going out there to vote. So it should come directly to the people and based on total votes, yeah, not be, based yeah. on electoral, yeah. uh, and right. divided by state and population, all that. Yeah. I really, that I mean, sense. but that's a whole other debate in itself. Yeah, I mean, there, there was some, it, it's supposed to be a safety. And I mean, when you think about it, um, I don't think we've adapted to what it was when it was, you know, enacted. Enacted, right. So, um, I think it needs a little bit of revision. I don't think it should be completely kicked out just because there is uh, just, you know, representative states, population, gerrymandering, from what I understand, right. at least. Um, 
but I'm always curious about um, how people, um, you know, cry about the presidential election or they cry about their governor. But yeah, you should. We got to start from the bottom folks. because yeah, those things are, uh, affect us in a big way. Right. But your most immediate needs and the things that affect your kids, your yeah. family, the school, right. the, your no, taxes, I, I, bro. Yeah, the taxes no. can can make the difference between you getting out of a hole and buying a house or yeah. being successful yeah. to especially to seniors who are fixed, to fixed income so yeah. um you know seniors get treated bad trust me i know almost there yeah, there's, no, there's 63, so, so you don't you don't go you don't go yeah. man you i had all that hair <laughs> at 63 i'll be all right <laughs> so, now um when you talk about local elections it's from that pothole in the street to your kids going to school it's upholding as far as the tax dollar that's being spent to that response time on that 911 it's everything locally yeah. it's based on that vote yeah that vote transcends across every quality of life when you talk about your community so it's important that people understand well i don't own the property so i'm not going to vote well that landlord is going to raise a tax based yes. on the property taxes that's going to impact you that car you're driving where your kids are going to go to school. So you cannot get away from the impact that a single vote would have yeah. uh, on the quality of life that you would you would be living along with your family. So it's important to participate. It's just right. getting people to understand that you need to participate. Yeah. The numbers have power. They right. have presence, and they can be felt. Yeah. Um, See, here in Connecticut now, since I'm so new here, since I'm new here, I'll have to do my research to research some of the candidates from Bridgeport, the senators, right. and because I don't, I, I really don't know. I mean, I used to vote mayor, governor, and stuff in New York, um, and I'll do the same thing here. Now that needs to be done. That needs yeah. to be done across all of the, all of the voters, as far as understanding the candidate that's saying that, that you know you could say I'm going to run. But what platform do you bring? Yeah. Uh, right. What, yeah, what, what industries about? are you yeah. talking about impacting? Right. But equally important, wh wh what's your background? Where do you come from? Mm -hmm. How involved are you in that community? Um, you know, you have city council members in our areas that don't do a damn thing for their constituent, but yeah. show up when it's time to elect. Yeah. Um, they show and up and vote for a budget uh, that sometimes they sit on a committee that's a conflict of interest because they work for the city themselves. Yeah. So there's so many things that, that, that layer that we need to bring out although the community knows it the participation keeps decreasing because as you said in the beginning oh it doesn't matter mm -hmm. it does matter mm -hmm. it super does and that's where you know at the same time we have some people that are hold elected office in within city council that are doing a great job but the majority aren't you have state rep you have state senators what are we bringing back how do you justify having a city that you call bridgeport where you have two bridges shut down for over 50 years. Yeah. Bridgeport. Uh, you know, with so no bridges. bridges, it's, with no bridges it's huh? so simple as that. I, I, you yeah. know, and you, when you talk about these bridges, you're talking about saving lives because if there's a fire or something, yeah. you have to go around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Major there, emergency. You, know, yeah. you have one. I have about, a theory about that Congress <laughs> bridge, but I ain't going to say it. Well, she, but, you know, you, um, my wife was telling me about. Uh, uh, a bridge that goes to um, Pleasure Beach. Pleasure Beach been that, shut down for over thirty something years, and, and it's they won't like, we're missing it's out. It's a, it's a. It, now you got to take a ferry, and that ferry actually is uh, it was a, it's a taxi. A, right? It's a taxi, which was done um, throughout the week, and then the administration continued to decrease the hours up to a point. They only had it either one day a weekend or two days, and yeah. they continued to diminish and minute diminish. It but just doesn't make sense. Ple Pleasure Beach is a, a is a treasure in itself. Yeah. But your your accessibility is very limited. Right. And there's there's no reason there there is no reason for it. And every time we keep waiting now, supposedly um, Congress through Bridge uh, is almost fifty million dollars to get built. Well, if you build it ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the dollars keep going down, and you know the cost would have been de uh, much much less. So it's about accountability. Yeah. But you know, it's not only that. That, for example, is also with a federal level. You know. Who are who, who are these people running for federal positions? Right. I see some of these people that run for federal position. They want Bridgeport to support them. They come and get the votes. Then Goodbye. you don't even see them. Mm -hmm. 
I, I I ask you which one of some of these uh, federal elected uh, officials have local office in Bridgeport, the biggest city in the state. They don't. Yeah, they should be headquarters to a lot so, of these platforms. So we need we we need to continue to fight, and we need to empower our people to understand that these things are happening because of our lack of participation, and the way, way to change is through participation. participation. I'm really happy you say that because that's what I want to ingrain in people. You, you, you can tell, I think. Uh, Driving, you can actually tell. Uh, you can actually tell who is paying taxes or voting, and who's not right. because of the way the roads are. <laughs> well, you have BlackRock, which have about 25, 22 to twenty five percent of the turnout voter turnout, yeah. and the, you don't mess with them because they'll come for you. Yeah. And then you have the 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 North End in the area here, which they're involved, but they've they've gone down as far as how really active they were in the past but then you have the east side east end which are single digit turnout yeah. um but believe it or not and then you have a a, a margin of victory that's 200 yeah yeah or less that's so any of these districts themselves could make a significant impact right you know you have a mayoral election with ten thousand voters vote let's say and then just the East End has over 6,000 possible voter could that turn out to vote, mm -hmm. and they don't, but if they do, imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you said something uh, that kind of stuck with me. So a lot of the council persons that run, that, they run on challenge a lot, right? Right. Like they just- Well, listen, how can, how can you, you get involved a little more? Because, um, well, the, you know, what if someone wants to get a little more involved than just voting, right? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What what should they do? There might be someone sitting or who's going to end up watching this. Who, how can I get more involved in just voting in, in, in a place that I can lead? Like, what is what is the roadmap? Well, well you have an opportunity to sit on a commissionership position throughout the city. Uh, you have an opportunity to sit on town committee. So, and then you have position board of education. You have position city council. See, the issue is that you have people that work for the city and you have others that are elected, such as city council, that sits on the town committee. So that town committee nominates that person to run. But those people that are nominating the person to run owes a job to someone. So they have to vote for who they're being told to. Mm. So that's part of our problem. We have to create transparency mm -hmm. and we have to, you know, in some way, stop those that work for the city to hold ele elected office right or those that are appointed such as the town committee and it's like a lot of favorite debt oh without a doubt it's corruption i think that's so yeah. i mean i, think that's a, <laughs> I mean that, that it's corruption in a grand scale <laughs> yeah, but it's like a nationwide to a degree problem. where it's like no it, it, it's it, nationwide and, and we need to we need to 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 really br bring some clarity to it you know, you, you can't sit on a committee to vote on a budget, even if you abstain from certain committee. Right. At the end of the day, you're still voting. That paycheck comes, the, yeah. you know, if you abstain, you're not helping because you're not saying yes or no. You're actually taking away a vote. Yeah. Right. So, but you, you what you're doing is you're making all those other votes have more power. Yeah. So when, when you don't participate, you're not not you're not neutral. Yeah. So. I want people to understand this. Not participating in the voting process doesn't make you doesn't neutral. make you neutral. No. It no. just gives whoever yeah, has a, a lead yeah. more of an unfair right. lead because now it's proportional. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I would also add to that is the neighborhood um, zoning, uh, NRZs. Uh, I would encourage people that live within certain communities to find out who are part of the NRZs because those are very important role to understand what's going on from a um, infrastructure, uh, economic things that's coming to their neighborhood. Right. And through there, you begin to understand your community and you begin to know who's who. And, you know, go, go and meet them, have open forum to talk about these different things. So that gives you access to bring yourself to understand your community, but also gets you an opportunity for the community to get to know you. So from the NRZ to... Um, the other commissionership within the, 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 from the zoning commission to the fire, to the police, um, and then the elected office from city council to board of ed, uh, state rep, state senate. Um, you can volunteer and, yeah. and follow one of your local elected officials, see what they're doing. 
So entry level into being more than a voter, this and that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You can so what's the what what's the lowest entry level that you can go into? Tomorrow you could decide to run for whatever position you want. There were I mean, from my my perspective, there really isn't an entry level. It's a matter of participation. Being, be not not I, doing I would it say, to do it. Like I I know I could run for mayor tomorrow, but, but not tomorrow. I, I would say if but you want, if you want to do something, start by understanding your community, get involved with the NRZ. After the NRZ, I would look at the city council. Okay. Um, and if you, you're not in city council, but you're involved in government uh, in some type of a- operation or some type of function that you understand how it operates, then you do city council. Right. Or from there, I mean, my ability to go from the oper- operational side of government, my institutional knowledge or experience within the community, my education experience, I uh, ran for mayor because those are the three different aspects because that's what you I felt you need to kind of be a, a, in a leadership position with the city from right. an operational side, from a community side, but also from an edu- educational side. Your resume is strong to say, you know, I can do the job. Can you think about the specific moment or thing or maybe combination of things that made you say, I'm going to run for office? The people. I never said I was going to run for office. People. Mm -hmm. Residents of Bridgeport saw my capability, my interaction with them, my educational experience, me being in the community and what I worked for the city and what I was doing to address any issue they brought to me. Many were like, you should run, you should run, you should run. When you say I'm going to run by yourself, then it's not going to work. I didn't know that. It has to be something that you feel the community is saying you're going to run. And then from there, the process start thinking and you look, okay. Makes sense. Let's look at some things, look at some resource, some people, some supporting cast that will that's, come that's with you. That's very interesting. See, it, I, that I really yeah. didn't know that because... Um, I Often mean, it, you will have people say, you should run for this. I mean, you, you have to accept uh, yeah. You have to accept right. that nomination, of course, or, or say, yes, maybe I should, and then make the decision to do it. But um, that's very important. That's very like yeah, reminiscent yeah, yeah. of George Washington himself. Has to, like, yeah. He didn't really want part. Uh, it has to come from the people. Because <laughs> if you're saying you're going to run and then you're going to run and then you got to develop the platform, the idea and bring the people in by the people saying for you to run, then you already have the people. The other things come to place and then you have the army ready to go. Yeah. yeah. It's a nomination. It's mm-hmm. a... It's a yeah. Uh, Indirect people's nomination because I never yeah. get nomination by the party. That, that one, that's, that, 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 yeah, that. but the, it's supposed to be the people's nomination, right? right? right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wow, wow. But um, you know, it, it, it is a tough. I mean, you have a business background, you understand the job, but the theatrics of it are they got they, you know they they pull a lot from you. No, it could be emotional drain because remember when you're in this thing, you're you're trying to take. Um, this is almost a $1 billion industry where you're mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. trying to bring some changes. Yeah. And some people that have been putting the food on their families day by your back don't want that. Uh, it is and, a transfer and, of and, wealth in a way. Yeah. Right? So some people don't want to let that go and they'll do by any means necessary yeah. to kind of make sure they keep it. And, yeah. you know, many things that we've seen has been shown as evidence as to what some people are willing to do. So. It's part of it. Um, what's something about you that most people don't know? It's nothing crazy, just something simple that maybe well, I found out yesterday that one of my guests is an actor. I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, if, or something you would like people to know that maybe you never got a chance to say. Um, I, I think one of the key things is that people. Sometimes um, certain people say, you know, I look very uh, stern and hard, and but I'm very mellow, chill type of guy. Um, you know, I'm not judgmental. I give people opportunity. I give them resources, but then I hold them accountable. And honestly, you know, through the campaign, that was one thing. Oh, you look very hard. That's who I am. I'm, I wasn't raised in a, you know, cuddly type of, let me give you a right. hug. Let me pump you <laughs> up environment. I had to earn and get what I got on my own. So. Yeah. My demeanor is who I am, but it doesn't um, translate into all of my characteristics. And, yeah. Uh, so I, I would agree with um, you. I, I, I do see you as someone mellow, approachable, but also very uh, calculated. 
in in a good way. No, you uh, you you have to be calculated to understand what's where you at, where you want to go, but you also have to be um, with certain presence to make sure you control what's coming at you. Because let me tell you, when you're down, that's when you find out really who's with you. And, that's true. And, and that's that's what you learn, what you continue to learn, because in the glory times, everybody want to celebrate. Yeah. When you win, everybody oh, yeah. wants to celebrate. But yeah. the difficult time is really defines your character and those that are around you. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we want to have this conversation because um, obviously uh, it's, it's a long time from running again. <laughs> right. uh, I know you know by the time you know we go to the cycle again, this is gonna be aged out. But uh, we really wanted to get to know you uh, well, with more in depth, and I think it's more fair for people to get to understand. Uh, you know who you are, mm. what you represent. I learned a lot. Well, in this interview, probably the one thing I'll add is uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm into crypto. Oh I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me so too. yeah, me too, me too. well, actually, way down, down than Bitcoin. But yeah. I mean, that's you know, people will be like, what? <laughs> I, I got a quote here. You probably know. Who, I have a quote here. You probably know who it is. It's uh, it says John Gomes is one of the most genuine young men I have ever met. He's a person of his word, which I find rare these days. Mm. Yeah, you already know who that is. So it it, it can only come from a woman who has <laughs> knowledge, wealth, and and, 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 and experience life life to its fullest. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I'm very humble when I hear that, and that's why we do what we do. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I'm here because of the people behind me pushing me. There's times, there's days that you're just like, damn, you know. Yeah. And then you get that phone call, you get that, let's go grab breakfast, or like, you know, what's going on that keeps you going. But there's some days that you're like, oof, tough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you're built for this, man. You're built for it. You know what? Um, what I've learned is that through time, I've become more rational. I've become more. Um, strategic i become more analytical mm. and um and 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 through my campaign i become more spiritual i've always said that i've been religious but there was a difference when you become spiritual because for us to go through what we went through without the resource and yet we maintain to where we needed to maintain there's only a higher power that's guiding us. And I think that same power is saying, you know, you got to go through some trenches right now because we got to do some some work. But I think that in itself will come. And that, that's one thing that I've kind of become very, uh, you know, not at the moment. I mm. take it, I stop, and I react. And I... Uh, I think that that's part of also aging, your your age, your time, yeah. Yeah. and what you've been through. Gather patience and all that stuff. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Patience has become, I tell you, the old John would it jump It takes a up. lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially in the corporate world, results. Yeah. Uh, uh, and also being someone, like you said, uh, uh, it wasn't a cuddly uh, bringing, um, mm -hmm. I think we we have to thank the struggles no, to make us who we are. But um, yeah, yeah, you you learn you do learn to sit back a little bit and and, and take a couple more seconds before you react. And, and those yeah. few seconds make yeah. a huge difference in the outcome yeah. and the outcome you're seeking. And yeah, I gotta say, man, it's it's been very informative. Uh, we're gonna have another one. Uh, well, because uh, there's not enough time <laughs> no, uh, to touch it. on different things, and the more I get to know you, and, and full transparency with all my guests, um, I want I, I try to find things about them that most people don't know. Uh, I think it humanizes people a mm -hmm. little more yeah. to, mm -hmm. to to not just ask you. I mean, we definitely wanted to touch on the obvious election right. and politics, your theories and the ideas about how things work, how they should work, and the data at the right. end of the day, which is data, it's numbers. Right. It doesn't lie. Um, but we wanted to bring people in and just humanize. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about, and, and we're going to have more of these. Right. Uh, but hey, we, we want to thank you for being on the show, right. um, giving us your time, your insight, uh, especially during a difficult time uh, of many factions. Right. But through transparency, I was asking Vizu, like, man, I, I need to know a little more because I know him from 
you know, shaking hands and the, and, and yeah. the, it was like, but you spent, you know, you you were on the trail. I just want to have a genuine conversation and, and stuff. And I just so happens that Net is his uh, sister. Yes, yeah. there, there's a she, big circle yeah, of, of connection between some of the guests I've yeah. had. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, no, and, and that's been really good. Like so, super. Yeah, but having you here definitely amazing. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you're in good company. I've had people that are community based, giving back, have sacrificed mm -hmm. a lot to be what they are and uh, have succeeded, right. but never stopped giving back. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah. congratulations um, on your vision, your idea. Thank you. Like, you know, we come from an environment where we're always striding. For the next one yes. and you know uh, vehicles such as the, this gives that opportunity for the younger ones to say you know what i'll join and keep the movement alive because yeah. that's what we started yeah. in my campaign it was a movement and uh, the movement encompasses everything and this this uh, show itself it, it is part of that movement mm -hmm. because it is us through our words through our action through our participation in our community that we could change it Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, congratulations! I'm humbled to be here with y'all. Thank you, and I hope uh, I delivered what was expected. Shout out to my co-host, by the way. This is his place. <laughs> <laughs> when I brought up the idea on a regular night of, uh, you know, yeah. having some of this strong coffee, yeah, uh, I was like, th we could do a podcast here. Yeah. I was like, and I will, I love his approach and perspective because you know, different ages, different backgrounds, but we struggle about good friendship. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to have a, a good dynamic because, uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to have dialogue, yeah, and and censor and uh, you know, unedited dialogue. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's always important to hit on the issues, but as you said, people also got to see the personal side yeah, of the individual to understand that you're not just standing up there and, and reciting or talking about certain things without experience, because that's where you really find out who's who and what they're about. And I and I challenge you to continue to challenge yes. those that you see in the positions that could be of a difference and make sure they delivered yeah. That's the uh, goal. And what so, they say they're going to do. One thing uh, that you have championed is accountability. And let's, let's walk with accountability. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to leave you with. Tiny Bar Chats.